Welcome to Rap Stories, a show where I get the background on some of my favorite albums of all time by the artists who made them. I'm your host, David Dennis Jr., and today I'm joined by Big Crit to discuss his album, Forever is a Mighty Long Time. It was 2009. I was in grad school in Evanston, Illinois, and had somehow managed to become a weekly guest on a radio show that aired every Tuesday night all the way in Staten Island. The host, Emilio Sparks, had been palling around New York with a music exec named Johnny Shipes, who was developing a roster of incredibly talented MCs under his cinematic music group. One artist that he couldn't stop talking about was Big Crit. And as soon as I heard what would become the debut mixtape Crit was here, I couldn't stop talking about him either. I followed his career closely early on, going to his early South by Southwest show in 2010 and yelling out Mississippi every time I saw him. I'm gonna be honest, even as great as Big Crit was, he surpassed every expectation I've ever had for him. Crit has dropped so many incredible projects, the body of work that stands up against anyone in rap. So it's hard to pinpoint my favorite, but I can easily say that Forever is up there with Crit's greatest works. The double album is the full Crit experience. Of course he's doing some of his best rapping on Confetti and Big Bang. Sevenstein and 1999 are bona fide hits, and these are just the first four tracks. Forever is a Mighty Long Time is also an emotionally resonant piece of art about home, spirituality, love, and internal conflict. Big Crit is one of the great musicians of our time, and someone who makes me feel so damn proud to be a kid from Mississippi. Forever is a Mighty Long Time is a testimony of Chris' genius and a monument to what it means to be black, southern, and brilliant. Forever is a Mighty Long Time is a reminder that Crit was here and we're all the better for it. And here to discuss this phenomenal album is one of my favorite rappers and Mississippi brethren, Big Crit. Welcome to Rap Stories. <laughs> what's good? What's good, man? Man, it feels like a feels like a reunion. Feels great to <laughs> <laughs> great to Man. see you. Yo, that intro though. <laughs> you don't even need me no more. Right. Look. <laughs> <laughs> you just started the show, man. You just started the show. We wow. need you. Wow, man. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. It's uh, it's amazing to be here to be able to chop it up, brother. I want to start with talking about 1999. This takes me back to high school, Jackson, Mississippi, and on the album you talk about eating lunch by yourself in the cafeteria. And I can totally relate because I was socially awkward, but I was at the parties. Like it took me to the eighth grade dance and like hearing the songs that made you want to look at find a girl, right? Exactly. Like I was thinking, <laughs> like it put me in the place of, I don't know what the Meridian songs are, but in Jackson. I mean, we, it's, just, it's the same songs. <laughs> so I'm just making sure. I don't know if it's a different, but like same I was thinking songs. like it took me to like catch the wall. It took yep. me to like those type of songs. So what goes yeah. into making 1999? Man, first off, it, Manny Fresh. I actually had the opportunity to work with Manny because I was actually, you know, working on the album. And Manny literally played me the beat and then Lloyd was already on the record, bro. And I looked at Manny like, man, I have to have that for my album. And Fresh is one of those people where he he understands the creative process and then he, under, like, he understands tone, vocal pattern. He's like, yo, Chris, it's whatever. He's like, man, I've been holding on this for a little minute. Man, I think you'd be perfect on it, right? And so now the pressure's on me to actually make, like, do my verses and make it and give it the, my appeal as well. And then um, even working with Lloyd, that was like the first record I had actually had with Lloyd too. No, I actually had, I was on Lloyd mixtape before that. So it, it kind of worked out in a sense. But once I was able to actually record the record, send it back to Manny, everybody heard it. He was like, yeah, we know what this is, right? Like this is, this is definitely, one of those ones, and you know, I've never chased radio before ever, and it just was like this natural thing, being from the South, Manny on the beat, obviously, and then having Lloyd, you know what I'm saying, do mm -hmm. his melodic thing, it just made sense, boss. Take me to 1999, I wanna hear the like, cause I, like we were talking about this in the pre-production about like, what were we listening to? I was saying Monkey Swing, I was talking with Josephine <laughs> Johnny, <laughs> like they were not, they looked at definitely, me like I was from another Man, country. definitely, definitely Josephine Johnny, Trigger Man, uh-huh, right. You know, doo -doo 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 -doo. Mm -hmm. No doubt, you know what I'm saying? And then it's so crazy, I actually started producing around that time too, you know, back in 1999. So it was me also doing a lot of sampling 
um, of other people's records, man. But I mean, bounce. Uh, you talking about uh, Luke, and you know, and 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 so I understood that in a sense. But uh, being able to actually create from the idea of actually 1999, I mean, it was exciting. Manny Fresh and everybody that was producing back then, they had a keen way of letting you still be, what's the word I want to use? Ratchet, mm -hmm, right, but it mm -hmm. still worked right. on radio too. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to really worry about it being too clean in, 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 in when it came to the verses, because, but at the same time, it was like I could just be as country as I wanted to be. Right. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that song takes me to to that place, and so I, yes. you know, hundred uh, percent. Yeah, and there's also you know there's a lot of discussion on this album about what it means to be home. You know, hmm. um, obviously there's Georgia Fournier about the yes. guilt sort of of leaving Mississippi um, yeah. for bigger cities like Atlanta and L.A. And obviously I can relate. I left Mississippi, you know, and I'm in Atlanta mm -hmm. also. And so tell me what what home means to you, and what does Mississippi mean to you? I mean, Mississippi means everything to me. Being from where I'm from and wanting to shine. A positive light on Meridian, Mississippi, on Mississippi as a whole, and want want people to actually come see where I'm from, right? I'm um, growing up and looking at the stereotypes and looking at the movies and the way people, you know, view Mississippi. It was always this uh, battle or hurdle to overcome, right? I always wanted to be a part of the conversation. Um, doing Georgia Fournier was also me, you know, taking into consideration that it would be nice if I could have blew up out of Meridian, Mississippi, if I didn't have to leave home. Um, to chase my dreams, but it's geography lottery. And I talk about that a lot, where you not in control where you're born at, you know, in a sense, but everywhere I went, it was like I had this extra pressure to prove myself. The minute I told people where I was from, it almost created a deaf ear um, to the listener. So at that point, it was like, I gotta be the best producer I could be, the best freestyler I could be. The, I gotta write, I gotta be able to rap on any kind of beat you put in front of me. And I think people like David Banner really kind of showed me that I have to play more than one position to sometimes just work with people, you know, in a sense, um, and kind of break down that uh, stereotype or the way they may view where I'm from. That's a complicated thing also, as somebody who also feels like I represent Jackson and love the state, sometimes you feel like you have to leave in yeah. order to shine that light, but you want to be there. It's tough because like, you don't want to feel like you sold out or you did something else, but you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a duality to that, that you got to sort of carry it, but you know you can't be there at all times. Exactly. I mean, but then you, 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 the understanding is to bring that knowledge back, right? Um, and then hopefully people can look at your trajectory and then, you know, either use that, that road that you paved or look at the things that you didn't do quite right and then adjust in a sense. Um, you know, it's, it, even looking at what Ray Shermer was able to do, you know, being from Tupelo or you look at, um, Dear Silas, which I think he's been able to be very successful, but still be in Mississippi. Um, but there are benefits to being able to be in a city that um, where hip hop is actually being cultivated. You know, when people pull up, when there's not only a war show, but where everybody can get in the studio at one time, it's really hard to sell somebody on flying to Mississippi to record with you. So um, we ain't quite got over that hump yet, but mm -hmm. maybe we could put a, start putting on festivals and actually curating a way where people want to come and see, you know, where we get this grassroots Southern soul aspect from. Right. Shout out to yeah. dear Silas. We went to we went to grad, uh, grade school together. Back, yeah, that was up. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. You recorded this album mostly in Los Angeles, right? Mostly in Los Angeles. I recorded and I recorded and it was between Atlanta and Los Angeles. Why those two cities and what was going on in the, in those cities that sort of made you want to lock in there? Well, a, a lot of I mean, when you think about where the musicians are normally at, I mean, mm -hmm. they're normally traveling between New York and L.A. Clearly, Atlanta because uh, I produce a, a large amount of the album myself. So it's like being here and then being able to work with certain musicians while I was here. Um, but then some of them, like Keon Harold, you know, always, you know, he's moving around back and forth. Um, it's uh, being able to get in with uh, DJ Khalil, who's based out of LA. You know, uh, DJ Dahi, DJ Campers based out of uh, the East Coast. And so it was like normally being in LA, everybody's going to find their way out there. They're already working on something. So it's easier to kind of get in and work with everybody in that sense. Even this mixing is a little different out there. You okay. know, you, you you can run into or you can work in studios where very popular albums have been mixed for years. Mm -hmm. And so you can ask and request for certain equipment and stuff like that. Gotcha. So okay. there's a lot of a lot of stuff, you know, that you can use out there. There's so much of actual hip hop like music culture and history 
and hip hop history is in Mississippi. You know, I interviewed yeah. Too Short. His fo his folks are from Mississippi. Snoop, Man, folks are like the so sound crazy. is from Mississippi. Yeah. Nas's dad is from New Mississippi. So. Exactly. Snoop family, Nate Dogg family. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of people. A lot yeah. of people. Exhibit family, I think, from Mississippi. Right. And so there's, I think there's a way, in this album in particular, but in general, that we talk about blackness and our ancestors. That's particular to the way we talk about Mississippi. Like, you quote Fannie Lou Hamer, sick and tired, be sick and tired on this album. And, like, what is it about the history of Mississippi and its, and its blackness that you carry with you in your art, in this album and in general? Oh man, just uh, my 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 morals. My grandmother was a, and both my grandmothers played a huge part in my mm -hmm. life. Very church going, like God fearing, sense right. And so when even venturing into this music, I never lost sight of um, spiritually what I was trying to do with music. The thing about Fails in My Long Time because it is a double album is about talking about the duality of what I deal with. If you go back to Forever and a Day, it's me as a kid and I'm sitting on the steps and I'm looking to the left or right, and then you see the church house and it's across the street from the strip club. And so I think we all have this moment where, you know, normally the things that you really like to do aren't good for you, but you you also know what you should be doing at the same time. This album gave me an opportunity to tell both sides of what I deal with, not only as a musician, but just as a human. And you wanting to do right, wanting to uh, have fun and, you know, and being excited about getting money and being out, but also a lot of stuff that you do, you just like, man, why am I even doing this? This isn't serving me in a sense, but it's fun, but it ain't serving me. And being able to really pinpoint on that, man, and I spent two years working on the album, mm -hmm. and I think it really shows, like, both sides of what I deal with when it comes to creating music. Yeah, and I, I, I want to talk about your grandmothers a little bit. I think yeah. uh, they're obviously... Huge parts of your career. I want to talk about the and get your insight on the power of having praying black Southern grandmothers in your life. Oh man, shout out to uh, Annie May and Lenny May. Um, it's it's super important because uh, not only is this the in the in the beginning, it's the shield that you get from having elders, right? To have a grandmother that'll you know just be there and and understand like what you may be going through adolescent, you know, to kind of just be like, ah, oh, baby, you don't need to deal with that. Or you don't need to be around that. But the warmth that comes with it. But there's also the uh, iron fist because you ain't going to play around, you know. And so my Annie Mae was a part of my, my earlier childhood with being around her. And so seeing a lot of what she was able to do as a... Uh, as a mother and taking care of my mom and, and just being around her she made me grow up really quickly, but understand mm -hmm. that being thankful for everything I got in the moment was very important, right? And then being around Lenny Mae, which is my uh, dad's mom, in uh, my teenage years gave me a groundedness like none other, uh, a way to be happy with what I have and to put in a, a work ethic that uh, I wouldn't take away. And then also understanding how to help me with my uh, aggression because I was very much a competitive child. I dealt with a lot of um, wanting to be, what's the word I wanted, like the cafeteria thing, wanted to be acknowledged, wanted to be noticed. And then so she figured out a way to really, she was the first person to record me doing anything. So she brought out a tape recorder and I started singing and I would freestyle. And that was the introduction of me being able to get a lot of my aggression and my creativity out. So I would be able to um, figure out a way to, it's like therapeutic in a sense. So both of them played a huge part in me finding this humble side of myself that I could always tap into this warmth and understanding of like people mm -hmm. and not going into every situation just mad because they don't understand what it's like to be a country boy from the South. Let's get a little bit in, into the album a little bit more. When, when was the last time you listened to it? The last time I listened to Forever is My Long Time, probably like two weeks ago. I try really? not to okay. listen to it too much. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, when it, when, it, when it comes to all my projects, man, I, I tap back in every so often mm -hmm. to check check out the young boy. Not why, too much. <laughs> why, uh, why do you say you don't, don't listen to it too much? I mean, because, I mean, it was moments in certain records that I was actually going through things. Like listening to Drinking Sessions is a difficult song. You know, listening to The Vent is a difficult record to listen to because it was like, it was uh, me actually, it's a therapy for me and I was in an emotional state. So when I listen to these songs, they have... Sometimes they have the a power to take me back to those moments. And so uh, I try not to just dive back into it so much so I can actually look forward to the music I'm going to create now. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
Well, we are about to dive into drinking stuff. So. Well, I have I have no problem talking to you. About okay, it. they ain't like you're gonna play the record. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting you mention that because drinking session is part of like a series to me, like mm -hmm. that is an evolution of started with the vent, that vulnerability, and all that stuff. That, so, how do you get yourself in that mental space? You know, I know for me, like as a, as a writer, there's all this anxiety about knowing that people are going to be seeing those very personal moments you know when you got to kind of push outside to be as authentic as possible so what is it like for you to get in that space to be vulnerable knowing that you know it's, it's a public thing mm. um so those those records were always meant for me to i put those out because i know that i needed to get that off my chest mm -hmm. right if i do 10 records and they're all uh club songs or they're all riding songs underneath that every day isn't a happy day is in a you know, I, I probably went through something. And so I, I need to express that part of myself as well. So when people interact with me, they know that I have those days too, right? The vent was, I really, I literally wrote that record on the anniversary of my grandmother's passing. Didn't realize why I felt the way I did. And then I wrote it. And then upon me playing it back, it helped me in the moment, right? Just like, oh man, I finally got that off my chest. I finally have spoken about this. And then what happens is when you play it for someone else and you see that they have a similar experience. And that's what music is all about. So it's like, how could I not put these records out? Um, I battled with alcoholism, and I spoke about that in interviews and in my music. Drinking Sessions was another one of those situations where I had overconsumed, and the way I felt in the moment, it was like I needed to, I needed to talk about how I felt, right? And I needed to express it, and the only way I knew how to do it was over a beat. And so that's exactly what I did. I wrote it. And the version that you hear now actually isn't the original version because you wouldn't have been able to understand actually what I was saying in the original version because I was in such a way while I was rapping it. So I had to actually recut, recut mm. it. <laughs> yeah. Was it like, you mean emotionally or? Well, emotionally and just uh, my enunciations. Okay. You wouldn't, uh -huh. have, you wouldn't have understood how, like, yeah. So it was actually getting back in the studio um, and actually having to evoke that emotion and recut again. Yeah. Okay. And so, on, you know, on Drinking Sessions, you talk about, like, protecting your heart. Imani Perry is a fantastic uh, writer. She said, um, we never get free by telling all our secrets, you know. And so that's something that I've, I've lived by. It helped me, you know, finish a book and, and get to that space. So, like, what does it mean to you to protect your heart as you're being vulnerable? That's interesting. I mean, because transparency is what kind of helped me. You know, we, you build up a superhero character in the music industry, right? And then let's say you have a bad day. Let's say that's you you protecting your heart as a superhero character. Let's say you have a bad day and then somebody asks you a question and you just break down, right? That's because you've been walling yourself off. You've been I mean, what you think protecting your heart, but you haven't been grieving or you haven't been expressing your emotions. You haven't been telling people how you really feel. Um, and so in my case, it was very much important that I started to tell people exactly how I felt. Right. It's like, oh, I'm dealing with this. I'm going through that. I have anxiety. I don't feel like getting on stage like, oh, I get nervous before every show. I have no problem telling people these things so they understand that I'm human. So in the moment that I have a bad day or I don't feel like talking or I'm not quite myself, they know that I'm it's because I've always been vulnerable and I've been transparent. And why? Which is how I started to protect my heart is by not always telling people no, I'm good when I'm not. Where were you when the album came out? Do you remember where you were the day it dropped? Where was I when the album came? <laughs> no, I don't actually. I think we uh, well, we did a listening a listening party uh -huh. for the album. I can't quite tell you exactly what I was doing in the moment. Probably, <laughs> literally, probably in my room somewhere, like in a corner, like oh Jesus, here we go. You know, every album I've ever dropped, I find myself by myself. Just like, oh, don't get on social media. Don't look at nothing. Um, but with that particular one, I, I knew what we had done with Keep the Devil Off, what that visual looked like and the, the amount of work that went into actually um, putting doing the video. And so there was more confidence in dropping that album than I'd had in previous okay. projects. Yeah, because I know that there was a, a lot of, you know, you were very cognizant of the way the Def Jam albums had been received mm -hmm. and things like that were you so did that add to the anxiety or were you just like i'm 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 fine because i know i've done what the thing i wanted to do um I, I felt like i was fine a little bit because we had already did 12 for 12 right and that was like the precursor and putting that out there so people i still saw that it was a, still the same amount of hunger 
when it came to like people actually checking my music out. Um, my only fear was that 12 for 12 would be how Forever and a Day was to live from the underground. To drop a project that's kind of so close, not anything like the album, and then people would be like, oh man, the album's cool, but I really like the mixtape or the project before. But it, we had curated it so much down to the videos, the photo shoots, the music sequencing. Mm -hmm. And then the only thing that had happened was the my sub that you hear, the end wasn't the same. And I ended up having to change the actual version a week before the album had to be turned in. Why'd you have to change it? <laughs> um, The very end had a breakdown that I couldn't clear. Really? Okay. And we didn't find out I couldn't clear it till a week before I had to uh, turn the album in. What what is that? What is the clearing process like for when you're independent, like doing it on on your own? How what does that look um, like? Um, it's it's tough, man. But it's also like it's it's tough in the sense that you don't know if if you fall in love with the record, you don't know what's gonna happen when they say no. You're right. You're like, oh man, yeah, like it's like, oh, I, I fall. I, this is perfect. I don't have the budget to clear, it, or they just say no, right? Um, and depending on how long you've been working on the album, you was, might have been banking on that particular song. Uh, but the beauty is, is that sometimes when you're independent, people actually look out a little more because they might not have beef with a label. They might not have already frustration or, you know, you never know. And it would have come to a lot of the older uh, soul music, you know, their catalog is owned by their children. So you don't really know what they dealt with with clearing before you came to them. Um, so when you're independent, it kind of gives you more of a personal aspect to actually ask people. And you're doing that reaching out sort of on your own or like you, you know? Oh, um, well, shout out to my manager, uh, uh, Dutch, you know, uh -huh. very, uh, <laughs> intuitive when it comes to like reaching out and, um, going through proper channels to actually get clearances. And then I'm also at the point now in my career where, man, I try to just make something that sound like a sample. Like I can't sing, I can hold a note. You know what I'm saying? Or I could get in with musicians that they understand, you know, where I'm trying to go. Um, and then even if you listen to uh, the Justin Scott side of Forever Somebody a Long Time, shout out to DJ Khalil, but that intro is not a sample. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so. That, yeah, it sounds, like a, it sounds like a complete, like, soul song that you just <laughs> threw on the <laughs> threw It's on not the a sample, man. <laughs> it's not a sample at all. And then the beauty of it, I was able to then sample that song to make the intro of the Big Crit side. Forever's a mighty long time, debuted at number seven, US Billboard 200. Yep. Peaked at number five in the top R&B hip hop albums. Let's go. Uh, Rolling Stone named it um, one of the best albums of 2017. It's a digital age, right? So it's all digital, not a lot of physical stuff. What's the function of a double album when, you know, we're not mm. picking it up from Best Buy and picking up double albums from Best Buy? So that was the weird thing, man. When we dropped the album, I thought it was gonna split it up. Like mm -hmm. it was gonna be like, oh, this, 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 that, man. It right. was like all the tracks just right, went right. straight down. <laughs> uh -huh. That threw me off a little bit. But I still come from that age where I love um, the booklet. I love the covers. And even though people couldn't tangibly get it in the moment, even when the vinyl record came, you understand the difference in size, right? Sequencing. I mean, some people are still um, purists in a sense. So they understand the idea of a double album and then we still had the CD at the time. Because physical and tangible things are still very much important in the digital age. Even if you're listening to it and it's every track going straight down, by the time I get the Justin Scott intro, you know that we took a total turn right. mm -hmm. to another direction. And that, mm -hmm. that, that, that entire album, the Justin Scott side, to sounds totally different right. than the Big Crit side. So you, I still was able to accomplish it, although it was all 22 tracks, just boom, right. running 22. And what what about the visuals? How did the art and all that stuff uh, come to be? It had a very sort of like old school seventies album cover feel hmm. to it. I mean, it was all me trying to kind of go from that the idea of the Renaissance mm -hmm. paintings back in the day when they had mm -hmm. the gold right, right. behind mm -hmm. them. Um, the the one is this this more superhero character, which is the big crit side, and then you have the more humble side of me that's you know still trying to figure out who I am and my spirituality, which is the Justin Scott side. Um, and even being able to do just the total contrast of what 1999 is, again, versus what Keep the Devil Off is, right? Um, and being able to tell both those stories at the same time. So many, so often people have asked me, you know, even sequencing, how does that work? And how hard it is when you do have a turnt album and then you have a vent on the album as well. This album gave me an opportunity. I didn't have to worry about that. Like, I, oh, this, the my subs, the confettis, it all goes and fits 
together on mm-hmm. the on the one side of the album, and then Price of Fame, uh, mixed messages. It all fits, and it, mm-hmm. it could have been sequenced differently, but they all fit in the concept of the album. So, what was your what was your um, measure for success for the album? Just putting it out, man. Mm-hmm. I've been talking about putting out a double album for so long, and mm-hmm. it seemed impossible. Um, not only financially, it seemed impossible. But just when you're trying to sell the label on putting out a double album, man, that's a difficult process. Um, I, I remember turning to uh, my manager, Dutch, and then a uh, uh, marketing um, uh, manager, Steve-O, at the time. And I was like, man, I want to do a double album. And I thought it was going to be like, no. I said, man, that don't make no sense. They was like, yeah, hell yeah, do it. You independent. Ain't nothing holding us back. And then that scared me a little bit, right? <laughs> But then after that, I kind of just set out on this mission and it just all started to fall into place. It all started to fit together. And then every time we got over a hurdle, um, God just kind of put something in my way to kind of smooth it over. And then mm-hmm. I was able to put out a double album. What was scary about it? Because it's a risk. It's a lot of music to uh, to digest, for starters. You you do have the, the capability of kind of beating a dead horse sonically. Like you can actually get to a point where, you know, some songs may sound the same, uh, subject matter might get a little muddled, um, but I was able to work with amazing producers that were always giving me something that I didn't create for myself. So all my beats, in turn, sound sonically different than their beats, but it all became this cohesive thing. Um, and then it gave me the freedom to talk about certain things that I hadn't had the opportunity to talk about, which is a record like Mixed Messages, and to be kind of vulnerable in a sense. And Price of Fame was what I was dealing with in the moment of just wanted to be Justin Scott sometimes instead of Big Crit, you know. And what are some of those, you said some of those hurdles that God sort of just smoothed out for you. What, what were some of those? i tell you one that's funny. Keep the uh-huh. Devil Off, I, I, when, I, when I made the record, first off, we went through 10 organ players mm-hmm. to get to the version you hear now. That was the first song I actually did for the entire project. I detuned it in a way where every musician that came in, it was all amazing musicians, would have to detune their instrument. And I didn't realize why. We got to the mixing process and every track was out of tune. Um, shout out to Andrew Dawson, because uh, he was mixing the album at the time. I was like, man, I don't know what we're going to do. It's all out of tune. It's not it's not fitting up and work. He's like, oh, man, I got you. I'll retune everything. And before we know it, Keep the Devil Off is in the perfect tune it need to be. I was like, man, I ruined the record, because some people were sending stuff back. I was like, man, I can't play over it. Um, and that was like the longest process I've ever taken, taken on an actual song was that one and to the point we finally got the right shout out to Shedrick Mitchell the right organ player and he crushed it and it's the longest song I've ever created <laughs> I mean keep the devil off is just like I mean this is it's just a classic song it's just one of the best you know it's one of the best songs in your catalog it's just sonically like church rock star stuff I saw you perform it um I think right around when this album came out yeah I mean it's just like there's just nothing like it there's nothing like it in out there, you know, first of all, what does this song mean to you, like looking back on it? And then also mm-hmm. the song like that, you know, to have somebody who comes up from a church background to make a song like this at this point in your career. Oh, it's awesome. I mean, it's mm-hmm. a due to my grandmothers, first mm-hmm. off. Energy wise, it was very important that I did something like that um, and was able to kind of musically go the distance with it, right? Um, with the organ and just full blown singing and just. You know, because I come from that background where you're not really, it's not all about A, B, A, B rap, three hooks and you're gone. Sometimes you you let the beat breathe. You you feel the music. You you clap your hands. You you dance to the song to the point where I even got a choreographer for the video to do the dance that I end up doing in it because it was very important that I showed people that, man, that you can be free in a sense with your music. Especially in a time where it was like, I felt sometimes me and talking about my spirituality so much in my music was getting overlooked for me always doing the, the crunk records, right? And it was like, nah, not this time, you know? <laughs> and so, and it was amazing for that to be the first single that we actually put out. Yeah, man, and for it to get the response it did. Yeah, it yeah. was, it was, it went platinum in the dentist household. It's on my son's Let's go. little playlist. So, <laughs> so Let's we, go. We Let's were playing go. that all, all across. Yeah, that's it's just like a, just one of the one of the phenomenal songs that that Thank that you've you, made. Um, overall, uh, how many classic projects does Big Crit have? All of them. All of them. <laughs> Every last one of them. 
Uh-huh. Even the ones you ain't heard. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to MT. I did a project called MTSDC, M Town Slowdown Click. Shout out to Texas for inspiring me to do that. But it was all screwed up album. My very first album was called Coming Out Hard. Uh, and it was a screwed up album. Dirty 30, I dropped in 2001. That's classic. All of them. <laughs> What's on the big crib, Mount Rushmore? Now we gotta, now oh. we gotta, uh, we gotta, um, you know, l- limit it down a little bit. Dial What's it down. You talking about album wise? Album, album, mixtape, whatever projects. What's oh on the Mount, Mount man, Rushmore? that's rough. All right, obviously, Crit was here. Okay, up there. Crit obviously. was here forever and a day. Forever was a mighty long time. I gotta put Wally Sparks, Queen City, King of the Queen. That that mixtape did a lot for me. Uh, yeah, man, and Catalatica, man. I got busy on Catalatica. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I yeah. look, Digital Roses Don't Die was my favorite album last year. Like that was Man, thank you. So that was so an I'm incredible a, project. Digital Roses, I felt like was the first time I put out an album that it was like, man, I knew exactly what I wanted to do and what mm-hmm. I was doing. Mm-hmm. It was just like some people weren't prepared for me to just be happy or for the music just we had just came out of pandemic. I was like, man, ain't no way people gonna wanna be aggressive. Like, man, it's about like we we made it. Like, let's be happy and talk about love. And so I think that's gonna be one of those albums, like maybe that's my Hear My Dear. That later on down the line, people will listen to it and they'll go back to it and sample it. And I'm cool with that. Right. I'm cool with that. Yeah, I, yeah. I swear by that album, man. I um I, you know, I'm not my my generation, I cried. I cried the first time I heard that song. Like that is just let's go. <laughs> you know, that's just yeah. Generational I mean, way, yeah. Oh man, yeah, that's, yeah, that, 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 yeah. I just, um, yeah, I felt that. I mean, I, as you know, somebody because I was, I was working on, um, well, I just finished my book about my dad, and yeah. it was about you know my, you know, writing letters to my son in the book and all that stuff, and mm. just like all that anxiety of parenting and all that yes. stuff was just like. I know we're talking about um, a different album, but I just got to tell you that, cool. that that song was just like just such an incredible song, brought me to tears, and it's my favorite favorite song from last year. Man, sure. thank you, boss. Thank you. I mean, and that's the, that's the purpose. Uh, mm-hmm. I think we all did a lot of reflecting mm-hmm. uh, in pandemic those two years, and so for me, it was about uh, just coming to grips with a lot of the things that I do based off of the generational aspect. You know, really wanting generational wealth, but just trying to break some of these generational curses as well in mind frames that we go through. And then the way down part is a lot of people got into relationships during the pandemic, or lost relationships, or lost loved ones. And just trying to figure out a way to grieve and let go and be at peace with the the moments that you did spend with people. Digital Rose, that you said that you wanted to do something that's happy. Forever is a mighty yes. long time. Were you happy when you were making that album? Somewhat. Mm-hmm. I was happy and somewhat I wasn't. I was going through a breakup at the time, so that mm-hmm. was a, a difficult thing. And then I was, oddly enough, busy in a way that was like kind of shielding me from a lot of my emotions that I was dealing with. Um, but I was able to create a lot of music on that album, Sober. So 1999, I wrote Sober, which was an amazing feat. Um, I think uh, even Substance, I wrote Sober. Because I got to the point where I thought that I couldn't write happy, fun records unless I was drinking alcohol. And I proved myself wrong, which was great. And it just showed me that I can be as creative as I want to be uh, without alcohol. So that album had a lot of growth spurts involved with it. That album excited that I was able to kind of convey through the music. Mm. What is, what does this uh, sobriety journey look like for you and, and, and you know, creatively but personally? I mean, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, uh. especially with how the world is and how much negativity and how much uh, impact social media can have and just a lot going on. It's really easy to kind of go into your vice in order to kind of get through the day. Um, I've realized that a lot of the times that I've spent happiest was when I was sober. Um, how productive I can be when I'm sober. Um, and just kind of wanting to convey that because when I was in my 20s and I was moving around and we was touring and we was having fun, uh, they don't tell you that though that 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 kind of movement when you get in your 30s, you know, kind of can curate a, a problem. Um, and so I found myself and a lot of my other partners that are in the music industry leaning on, you know, these vices that we had in a very unhealthy way. And so I kind of find myself talking about my sobriety or battling my sobriety and going back and forth with it because it is one day at a time. Um, But I encourage a lot of these new artists, man, very much be aware of the amount that you consume, how you consume, when you consume it. 
because it can take over your life aside from just having fun and being creative and it just becomes this thing that you do and you don't even know why you're doing it anymore. You mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago uh, a Texas-based uh, mixtape that you were doing and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, and one of the things about this album is just it's been incredible to see you because you know you have all of these southern icons on this album right that are now your peers yeah. it's bun b you got a oh, CeeLo verse oh, <laughs> so, you yes, know, so yes, you have yes. all this stuff what is it like suddenly to be in this space where all of these people you know are your peers there was a, um, i saw a bun b interview where he was talking about how you sort of inspired him and helped him with uh one of his projects and sort of you know gave him the engine that what is it like to be in this space now when you look around these peers are like you know you with them now Man, look, I'm a fan, first mm. off. And a peer, mm -mm, not even close. Mm. Them the OGs, the okay. starters. <laughs> I literally was around Bun at the uh, Houston, Texas rodeo show. And it was uh, Manny Fresh was there. We got Tila was there, Eight Ball and MJG. You got Mike D. Erica Badu pulled up. Um, man, uh, uh, you got Jazzy Faye came out. You got Charlie Boy. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna forget somebody's name. I'm so sorry if I do. Flip was there, Banner was there. Man, you talking about somebody that was nervous. <laughs> nah, man, I, it's cause I'm looking at them like they inspire me so much musically that it's always gonna be uh, this want to like, to work with them, this want to tell people about them and this want to learn from them as well. Uh, don't get it twisted, I got my peer group and they know how I am on this mic. But the OGs and already established themselves in a way where I'm trying to get to that same, that same place in that same spot too. You feel me? If you see Bun B live, I saw him live uh, South by Southwest once, and he just put it. He didn't have. A, he just put a CD in the thing, and they just played the CD through, and he just was doing hit after hit, like just no, you know, didn't need a DJ nothing, just hit it and rock the crowd for an hour, just, just yeah, off, off that CD. Um, we got Bun B actually doing um, interviewing Bun B for this. We're doing too hard to swallow. But what is the, what is the question that you would have always died to ask Bun B? Oh man, let me. I got you. I got you. Did he understand how his verse on murder would change the perception of Southern lyricism? Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. What, what do you? What do you? How do you think it changed it? Because the. The the idea of the concept back in the day, as far as being a, a lyricist, and I'm I'm talking about like similes, metaphors, double entendres, cadence carrying. I think Bun was able to do something that was spectacular on on murder in a way that was uh and even the tempo of the beat that um I don't know is daunting. Like I, I've I've seen them perform it before, to be able to rap something all the way through like that. Um, is amazing, and I think it kind of started to it, that planted the flag that we we get busy on the microphone, you know. And uh, that verse is one of those. It's epic for me, epic. Yeah. What's your most memorable moment making the album? Oh, for that was a mighty long time. Most mm -hmm. memorable moment? Yeah. Wow. Oh man, that's rough. Most memorable moment of making for that was a mighty long time. Jill Scott. Okay. All right. Jill Scott, I, I had the record, and literally I was like, oh, man, I got a concept for a hook. Woo, woo, woo. And then I was able to get in the studio with her, send the record, well, get in the studio for the record. And she was like, oh, I want to come up with something. I want to emote. I want to come up with something that's for the record. I mean, don't you know, it's very nice. The hook is good, <laughs> but I want to emote, do something. And man, I, I just, I've never seen, it was me, my manager, and um, the engineer, and just three grown men just sitting there just just enamored, just amazed about what she did on the record. And I was able to talk to her for like three hours after the fact. And then she actually came out to do the song with me on the tour. And it was just this magical moment, man. That was the first time, that was the most beautiful way somebody's ever told me your hook's cool, <laughs> uh -huh. but I'm gonna do some way right. better. <laughs> and, you, and this Jill Scott, you don't tell her no. You just oh, say, "Go man, ahead, just go ahead, like, do your whatever thing. you want to do. <laughs> whatever you, she could have took one of my verses off. All right. like, I was like, whatever you want to do. Oh, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah, that's yeah. Crit the rapper versus Crit the man. Obviously, as a part of this, you know, the album. What was your feeling on that as you're making the album, and how has that evolved in in the past six years since the album came out? The idea of making it was, again was just trying to be transparent as possible. Um. 
in 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 and oftentimes I did interviews and people would definitely ask me how I could go from doing, you know, the, how does it feel to do a record like country shit on stage and then pivot to event, right? Um, and so to be able to make an entire album to kind of show you how it works, how it goes. Um, and even, you know, again, to perform it was even amazing because the first half was, you know, the big crit side. And then you get to the second half and then I'm doing Bury Me in Gold. And you could just see the the roller coaster ride that happens in the show, right? And then Get Away, we end on that because that song still, you know, is both aspects of me in a sense. It's that bounce, it's that soul, but it's that aggression, it's the trunk. Um, and I'm still being vulnerable because the time in the time period and what we was dealing with was a lot of social injustice happening, which it still is now. And everybody just wanted to get away from the bullshit that everyone was on. Um and so, but now I think I've gotten to the point where I'm I'm able to blend the two a lot better, sonically and musically, um, which it, it's made it a little bit easier when it comes to making music for me. Because people have seen me go that, like there with a double album, Digital the Roses Don't Die, they've seen me go on full funk, singing, you know, whether I sound great at it or not. Um, and so now it just gives me the opportunity to just kind of be as free as I possibly want when it comes to music. Well, what does collaboration look look like for you? Or do you ever sort of get in a space where you feel alone in that space? You know, where hmm. you where you creative? Like, what does that look like to you? I mean, um, I, I used to feel alone a little bit back mm -hmm. in the day when it came to creating, mm -hmm. but I knew I was getting some of the best subject matter and music I could because I knew that this is exactly what I want to write about. This mm -hmm. is exactly what I want to sample. Now more than ever, I actually get inspired by working with other producers. Uh, just um, getting in with musicians, it, it's become this real collective effort of creativity. Um, and it, it shows me something new, it gets me out of my comfort zone. Um, Crit is here, I only produced one record on that album, which was, the, was a first for me. But it showed me um, the, the reach that I can go, like the, the, the difference in um, tempos, drum patterns, um, Nobody's gonna sample a song the same as I will, you know, and um, and so it's, it 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 gave me a different kind of understanding. Like, man, sometimes it's just good to work with other people to to take a flight to get out of my room. And mind you, bro, I'm the same way, bro. I I wake up in the morning, I produce in my studio, I write mm -hmm. in my studio, I do the rough draft. Um, but sometimes it's just good to be put in a spot where I gotta make a beat right. in L.A. or in New York, or I gotta mm -hmm. write immediately in somebody's studio and it that normally I get a, a different side of myself out of that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, like I um as a you know, as a creative in my own space where you don't really have to collaborate, you know, I have editors and things like mm -hmm. that, but like I get up, I take the kids to school and I'm by myself and I'm just in yeah. there and I and we talked a little early before about like I'll go to my little spots up here and just yeah. to be <laughs> Like not even just to want to talk to people, just to be in a space where people are sort of talking around you. Yeah, uh, and so move you can, the movement. Yeah, the move. Yeah, yeah like you just need. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, apparently, it's called introvert to extrovert. Like I don't want to go out and talk. I just need to be <laughs> in a community in sitting. a space. <laughs> yeah. you know where things are happening. Yeah. So, what, but what does like loneliness actually look like for you? What does it look like to be lonely? What does it look <laughs> like to sort of deal with that? Because sometimes you got to sit in it. You know. Yeah. Um. Normally, that's. That becomes when I'm I'm in a space where I'm not sharing enough about what I'm dealing with, right? Um, like again, I, I write my music normally comes from a space where I'm, it's therapeutic in the beginning, but I still need to let people hear what I'm creating. I still need to be able to be around a community setting, interact with people. I've learned that about myself. I used to think, man, I, I have no problem being alone. I ain't got no problem recording in studio by myself, and then over time, that kind of changed. And it shifted, right? I, I needed the energy. I needed the the critique. I needed the the laughter. Like you said, sometimes you just want movement around you. You just you know anything other than you just being in the house all the time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but for me, it's just when I'm in my thoughts and I'm not expressing myself. When I'm not talking about what I'm going through, and then I'm just kind of walling myself off. Is that's when the 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 loneliness factor hits. That's when the anxiety can come into play and depression. And I found myself in a position where I know and I'm aware of the signs and triggers of that. And then I start to overly express myself to my family or my friends. Um, even if it comes down to me writing a song about how I feel and then wanting to play it and send it to people, that normally starts a conversation in itself. And it just it's, it's necessary mm. to be that open, especially in my case, because I've seen myself in the past not say anything and then I'm 
end up, you know, crashing mm -hmm. in a sense, you know. Do you ever just create music just just for you or just for family members, just like tuck it away, or do you, are you always oh, putting man. this out? Hundred percent, man. I got I got so many songs you'll never hear, <laughs> <laughs> never hear, man. I was like, oh man, I woke up this morning, I want to make a song just about this to ride around in my car, mm. and it might not be the most popular aspect, but it it knocks in my whip, and I made mm. it for myself. Okay, yeah. Uh, what's the song on um, Forever's My Long Time that you think is aged the best? Oh, that's tough. The song that aged the best. Man, Subinstein, man, I can't front. Subinstein has aged quite well. I still do that song now. And every time it come on and go up, and even down to the singing part at the end, everybody's just singing, hands in the air. Just on a personal listening, riding around record, keep the light burning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, I really enjoy that record. Bilal crushed it, right. you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's that's one of my faves. And Price of Fame. That mm -hmm. still holds true to a lot of how I feel and a lot of how other people feel when they move around within this industry. But I, I'll say mm -hmm. um mixed messages going into keep the devil mm -hmm. off just don't feel just that's just not that's mm -hmm. not fair. That's just not fair. Like <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just those two back to back is just crazy. Yeah. Um I, and I know you're a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. Um and you know Nothing is, it, it, you know, there are a lot of things that when you're an editor and you harden yourself that could drive you crazy. There's some on this album that maybe nobody else knows that when you listen back to it, it drives you absolutely crazy. See, I already let you know about the Substance thing. The fact that I know it's a whole nother second part that is like, when I think about how I really wanted to end that song, it's like that my sub version would have been epic. And that part is like a minute and 52 minutes long. I was able to redo this old um, classic hip Southern hip hop record. And I'd made it all about subs. And it was some beautiful singing. And no one will ever hear it. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I might play it for you, man, if we get okay. up. But yeah, we gotta, yeah, we gotta it's going to blow your mind, man. Okay. And Manny, Manny produced it. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, never, never will be seen. What is something that you learned from Manny Fresh, just technically as a producer? Man, have fun, man. You get in the studio with Manny, man, and I. Every beat is a bop, and he he jig into it. He got a concept for it, and it's very open creatively, like how you should a approach the record, you know. Um, and 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 that I I kind of learned from kind of even going in with working with people. Like I've had opportunity to work with Bun a lot at this point, but being able to work with Manny showed me that um, it's okay to just be like, hey man, you should do this, you should do that. This would sound dope, maybe not that. In the OG, Manny have a way of telling you where you don't feel like he's like taking a dig at you creatively. It's just he's, he has a vision for it and he knows how to express it in a way. And it, it nine times out of 10 is gonna work. Um, and so I kind of took that from him to just find that confidence in yourself and in, in order to kind of work with other, you know, artists when you producing for them. And one, one of the interesting things I saw, um, I was watching the interview you did with your dad. Yeah. And y'all were talking um, right around when Crit Is Here came out, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, and I think, uh, and one of the interesting aspects about your life that I that I learned from there, um, well, a couple of things, we'll get to the other one later, but one is that um, the competitiveness that you have. Yes. And at <laughs> this point in your career when when forever's my long time comes out where are you competitive like thinking about competitiveness mm. in terms of other artists like where what is what does that competitiveness look like for you then and what does it look like for you now um i'm kind of where I'm, I'm 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 in the same space now as i was then it wasn't it's not so much that i was competing anymore right um after mount olympus i kind of realized that the game is not in favor Sometimes, like it's not, it's not like a fair shot's gonna come out of it, um, based off the amount of radio and attention the control record got versus my response. There would never have been an even playing field based off of a label and based off of me as an artist. So at that point, it's like I have no issue with just letting go of that competitive part of myself and pretty, pretty much just putting it in a position where I compete with my, with me and not any other artist, right? Because you really only just, you're gonna put yourself in a position where you're gonna make music that you're not gonna be happy with, it's gonna come out very angry. And I, I didn't wanna constantly 
go into a room and write from a frustrated, angry perspective. Um, live from the underground, I was very angry. And I realized that I wanted people to go to Mississippi so bad to stop talking down on Mississippi. And it's almost like I started to push them away with that message. For ever my long time was more like, man, whether you go there or not, I'm going to tell you about it and I'm going to take you there. Right. Um, and so that was the, the, the beginning of me kind of getting out of that. Oh, I always got to prove myself. Oh, man, I can't. Oh, they said this. Let me re rebuttal. And I was like, man, I ain't worried about none of that. Like, let me make great music. I'm a tour. And let me be happy with what I've been given in my career. And that's why I don't bother chasing accolades anymore. I really don't care about what, you know, people think of my music in a sense as far as my peers and stuff. Man, I do this for the listeners and for my own sanity and happiness, you know? Mount Olympus has, um, you know, is one of the most, you know, as a writer with a writer community from Mississippi and all that stuff, yeah. it is one of the most quoted lines that, like, every writer, <laughs> whenever award season comes out <laughs> yeah. for, for writers and all that stuff, <laughs> and everybody, Facebook statuses will say, you know, I'm not, you know, you couldn't even give to Andre 3000. Like everybody yeah. says that. And that's just such like a, a important exactly. line. Cause it's like y'all, like the people who judge what you do as an artist, mm -hmm. if they're not going to do it for the undeniable great art artistry out there, it does not matter what they say about us, or our art. Cause they just don't, they just, it's not they for don't them. Get they're it, just not going to get it. You know, and the so, South still got something to say clearly, right. but it is, you know, geography lighter, man. If I could have dropped Mount Olympus and then, the one of the biggest DJs literally grew up down the street from me, probably would have been a bit different story. You know, um, where I'm from is not a vacation destination at all. And so I always have to sell people on the idea of the South and the country and where I'm from, other than, you know, when you have seen movies and you actually want to go to these places, it makes it a little easier when it comes to the music aspect, you know? Um, but. I just focus more on trying to make music that just reflects me and then not always being a rebuttal or people getting a rise out of me to make a song. Like that's not a, I don't want to create from that perspective. And that, um, the other part of your, your, uh, the interview with your dad is about your baseball career. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just couldn't help but notice that, uh, every, you know, uh, every time teams from Jackson came to Meridian, we just busting y'all ass all the time. Man, you, don't you know, even that, do that. That must've that been shit, hard. Man. That must've been hard look, coming now, see, up. Now, see, see, now, had I not said we weren't competing, look, First off, not true. <laughs> Secondly, AAU ball, y'all wasn't that good in baseball, so we're not worried about none of that. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but it's just always been a competitive nature, but don't get it twisted, man. Red and Wildcats was a shit. <laughs> we're not worried uh -huh. about whatever y'all had going on, and I probably could have went pro, ended up mm -hmm. in AAA maybe, but I chose music. Okay. All right, I got you. <laughs> You know that that little 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 robbery always gonna be you know a little bit a little about bit it, there. Man. Yeah. Who are some of the new uh, superstar producers, especially out of the South, that you really like um, listening oh, to? Oh man, it's so crazy! Shout out to Buddha Bliss. Mm. I'm actually working with him right now. Obviously, clearly, I mean Metro Boomin doing this thing. Um, yeah, man. I mean, that's really. I mean, I've really been just. Oh, it's another a uh, cat man. Um, Shout out to, uh, dang, can't even think of my homie name right now. He actually did mixed messages. Super Mario produced mixed messages. Super Mario, thank yeah, you so yeah. much, man. <laughs> Shout thank out to you Super so Mario. much. He been crushing it, man. Um, yeah, man. But for the most part, I just been working with the same people that I've always worked with. Um, shout out to uh, Kenneth Whalem. Shout out to Keon Harold. Um, shout out to Robert Glasber. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, man. But literally, a uh, music major. Them people, um, childish, childish major. He doing his thing, yeah. Who from Mississippi <laughs> are you listening to that is that is next up? Oh man, I, you know, I definitely, man. Big Sun is always gonna be uh -huh. on my top tier list. Dear Silas doing his thing. King Ali, uh, Ray Schrammer got an album get ready to come out. I mean, if I gotta just move over to Alabama real quick, shout out to Flo Millie, she crushing it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of other uh, artists that's in Mississippi as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But if I forget their name, my, my apologies. Yeah, yeah, shout out to my brother Fifth Child and all the other folks. And, hey, and, see, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Elite Cash, Blue Cell. We gonna we gonna put see, on there for, for the there folks you go. for the folks out there. Shout out to Mo D. You know what right. I'm saying? Low Star Productions, East End, Quack. What's happening? Also, you know, part of this Mississippi things. Uh, we're from a long history of literary greatness, great writers. 
Uh, and I'm always curious when you're doing your art, especially back when you were doing this project, but at, at all times, what are you reading? Like, what are you, what were you reading when this album came out and sort of what are you reading now, especially that's inspiring you? Jeez, man, that's an interesting question. I've been reading a lot of self-help books, man. Mm -hmm. Well, right now I'm reading the art, the art of not giving a fuck. That's what I'm reading now. What was I reading when I did for, it was a mighty long time. Um, it's a, it was a breaking habits book. And I forgot, I forgot the name of, I forgot the name of the author. And it was like a, a love language book I was reading to at the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how did those books sort of inform the, the album? I mean, well, it was more about me being able to get over what I was dealing with in the moment to okay. write the uh, album. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> it, they didn't, I can't say they necessarily play any, uh, the, the love language one kind of helped me write some of the Justin Scott side, um, um, as far as the, um, as far as the record with Jill Scott, um, but yeah, man, it was more about me being able to kind of deal with what I was dealing with emotionally to be able to get in the studio and create. Are you somebody who sort of has to write through heartbreak or do you just have to get over it and then start writing? I gotta, I gotta talk about it, man. Mm -hmm. I actually gotta write or put it down or, or sing about it, mm -hmm. a hook or something like that. And like I said, like, so, so case in point, generational way down, the way down part, that 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 part was like five years old, right? But it was a it was something I needed to write about and sing about in the moment, and so when it came time to doing "Does the Roses Don't Die," it actually just worked for to to actually put it together with a generational part. But it was it was a song I had played over and over again because if I whenever that emotion arised, I needed to actually listen to something to make me feel better, and just my own experience clearly made me feel a little bit better about the situation. What is one song you're dying to sample but haven't figured out how to do it yet? One song I'm dying to sample, Liberation, Ooh. by Outkast. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's just it's just perfect, and so you could I could I could easily do it no justice. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, that's one you gotta. Yeah, that's oh, you just yeah, don't. Yeah. You just leave <laughs> yeah, it alone. Right, I think you leave yeah. it alone. Yeah, one of the few perfect songs that ever been ever been created. I think. So. Yeah, that was that's up there. Yeah. What is uh your favorite Pimp C line? What is my favorite Pimp C line? line? Oh man, that's tough. Oh man. Cause I was going, it's, it's always on high life. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't, I mean, I'll, I'll have to tell you that off camera, man. Cause he okay. said something that was like, I need some, I need some, I need some. And it's like, you can't, <laughs> <laughs> it's an extreme line, man. Uh, okay. I can't say it. I can't say it. It's extreme. <laughs> All right. Um, so we mentioned a little bit earlier, sort of the dances we going out, monkey swing, bunny mm -hmm. hop, Josephine, yeah. Johnny, all these yeah. things. Big crit. I know you, you cool, cool, calm, collected. You go out there. The DJ plays one of these line dances. Which of the one is he playing and you hitting the dance floor doing it? I mean, I'm swag surfing, man. <laughs> okay. I ain't gonna front, man. Like literally, we was at Bun Rodeo, uh -huh. seventy five thousand people. Mm -hmm. Swag surf came on. I ain't never seen no shit like that before in my life. Right. Uh huh. That many people swag surfing, man. That was that of the Cupid Shuffle. Okay. <laughs> and Cupid yeah, Shuffle, okay. shout out to Cupid, he was there. And then you know the traditional electric slide. Mm -hmm. If you just want to go there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you at the you at the you at the weddings, you wedding. I'm at the function. Doing, I'm yeah, at the function. At the, I'm at the barbecue. Right, yeah, right. definitely, definitely. What's your favorite song out of Mississippi that's not your own? Thriller's Gone. Okay. Thriller's Gone. BB King is definitely up there. Cadillac on Twenty Two is by David Banner. Mm -hmm. Um, Howlin' Wolf, Lightning. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. Yeah, I would stop. I would stop there. Okay. I'm thinking right now too. Uh, cause Boo Rosini did a song back in the day, mm. uh, when it was called Boo the Boss Player. Right, right. And now mm -hmm. we, we rolled around jamming that for a while. Okay. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Boo the Boss Player. I ain't heard that name in, or that yeah, man. in a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, all right. The final question, one question I want to add, I like to ask every artist who comes on here. What's one song from another artist that you wish was yours? Wow. Sam Cooke, Change Gonna Come. Ooh. That another, song is another amazing. Perfect song. Yes, I've, I've, I, I would my entire career I strive to write something with mm. some, that has that kind of impact. 
that song right there with Amazing Grace was like every time you hear it, it just takes mm -hmm. you exactly to the, the emotion. It, it get the same emotion every time. Mm -hmm. Yo. Man, Crit, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for talking to me about Forever is a Mighty Long Time, one of my favorite albums. It's been an honor, of course, to talk to you and catch up with you, brother. Um, that's it for today. I'm your host, David Dennis Jr. Thank you to everyone watching and listening. This is Rap Stories. See you next time. This podcast is produced by Podville Media for Anscape, a black-led media platform dedicated to creating, highlighting, and uplifting diverse black stories. Anscape, where blackness is infinite. Dina Morrison is the series producer. Our production team, Brittany Danielle, Rob Spiewak, Lenika Belfield martin Ethan Sands, and Eli Nellis. The series was edited by Stephen Williams, Kelsey Johnson, and Rob Ford. Executive producers, Steve Reese, Elizabeth Elson, and Oscar Zabayos. Raina Kelly is Anscape's vice president and editor-in-chief. David Oku created the original artwork for the series. Special thanks to Tracy Smith, Mike Shahade, Rami Mogadam, Katie Lawson, Beth Stoika, Anna Grambling, Ashley Melfi, John Gotti, Kelly Evans, Ryan Broadhead, and Kevin Wilson. And I'm your host, David Dennis Jr. Thank you for listening.